Hello everyone and welcome to the sixth installment in our webinar series titled uh, Swedish Research in Cell Biology. Uh, today we have the privilege of uh, hosting a lecture by uh, Associate Professor Claudio Canto at Linköping University here in Sweden uh, with his lecture being called uh, Reconstructing Wind Signaling, a Pathway at the Interface between Development and Cancer. And if you appreciate our webinar series and would like to see more of them moving on in the future, you can always find us on Twitter under uh, at Swedish Cell Bio. So I'll present uh, the agenda of today and also a little bit about the company I represent. And then I'll hand over the torch to uh, Krista Rantanen at Baker Ruskin. Uh, she's the director of scientific applications there. And she'll present Baker Ruskin. We're co-hosting this series together with Baker Ruskin. And then it's time for the main event where uh, Claudio Canto will present his lecture at uh, 1510. Following that, we will either have immediately live Q&A or we'll announce our next webinar in March and then move on to the Q&A. We'll see a little bit on uh, what, uh, what is suitable at the time. And depending on uh, the number of attendees, when we get to the end for the Q&A, we'll either stay on this platform or we'll move to a simple Teams meeting where you'll get to the opportunity to ask uh, Claudio live questions, not just written ones. So, who am I? Well, I'm Daniel uh, Donjesund and I work at Mimetech here in Sweden. Uh, we're a company that provides tailored laboratory and industry technology to uh, hospitals, universities, industries, and so on. We're located in the south of Sweden in the beautiful Kaskrona, and uh, we deal with everything from simple laboratory systems to advanced technical solutions. We're the general agent to several leading manufacturers worldwide, including then, of course, Big Ruskin. So if you're in Sweden and you need technical equipment, please find us and we'll see how we can help you. Um, of course, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, about a featured product. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the Invivo 400. Uh, I suggest that everyone who cultures the cell do so at physiological conditions uh, because I personally and subjectively believe that physiologically relevant results arise from physiologically relevant conditions. And if you want physiologically uh, relevant culturing conditions for your cells, the Invivo 400 is perfect. It's a hypoxia or physoxia system, depending on who you're talking to, where you can create an in vivo environment for your cells. The system allows you to control parameters such as temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. Uh, and come with internal HEPA filtration as standard, in addition to several other important features, but we don't have time to present all of this right now. If you want to know more, please visit our website if you're in Sweden. And if you're outside of Sweden, of course, then go to Baker Ruskin's website and they will direct you to their local uh, distributor. I also want to uh, end off this introduction with some suggested reading. Here we have a, a research article, um, which I suggest you read, uh, which is called Tumor Collection Slash Processing Under Physoxia Uncovers Highly Relevant Signaling Networks and Drug Sensitivity. And I've uh, chosen to quote a small paragraph from the abstract here. Uh, here we demonstrate that tumors collected, processed, and propagated at physiologic O2 compared to ambient air display distinct differences in key signaling networks, including the wind signaling network, and so on. So, of course, um, if you want to study these uh, the signaling networks under physiological conditions, contact us, I will help you. And with that, I'm uh, going to stop talking about my own interests, and I'm going to present uh, the Director of Scientific Applications at Big Ruskin, Dr. Krista Rantanen. Thank you. thank you, Daniel, and uh, thank you everyone for 
joining us this afternoon. Good to, well, I don't see you there, but I know you guys are there. So greetings from Finland. Um, I'm just going to very briefly uh, introduce a little bit more about Baker Ruskin. Um, so Baker, as you had, uh, Baker Ruskin is um, uh, manufactures and develops those hypoxia slash physoxia workstations. But Baker Ruskin isn't the only entity in this in, in this portfolio of companies. We also have Baker and Clean Air by Baker. And can you go to the next slide, please? So we are actually a global uh, operator. Baker being the hub in, in Maine, in the US, and then we have Clean Air by Baker in the Netherlands that does ESC, so biological safety cabinets and, and those sorts of things. And then of course, Baker Ruskin based in Wales. So, uh, and I'm their scientific director. So if you have any further scientific questions about hypoxia, physoxia, you know, that's, I don't know much about many things, but maybe about that I do. So please feel free to contact me. Another thing I want to uh, introduce to you guys and invite you all is Hypox EU. Now, Hypox EU is something that we put together um, last fall. It's a kind of a, a collaboration or society or, or venue for everything having to do with physoxia and oxygen signaling. And, and if you can go to the next slide, Dania, please, thank you. So what we do is that we have seminars. They have been virtual thus far. Uh, we want to have uh, or give the opportunity for younger researchers to present their work, like short talks, 20 minutes or so, accompanied by Q&A. And we usually have four talks, so it's about two hours um, all together, so not too, too extensive from, from anybody's day, but they have been really well received and we feel that that's something that the community needs. And of course, it's going to be unplugged published work. Also, this is, and this is good, uh, fingers crossed everything's going to go well, COVID-wise and everything, but we are planning to go live, to have a live meeting in Dublin in September. So you are all invited to that event. So High Parks EU, we do have a website, highparkseu.com. So go and check that one out. And oh yeah, I also included uh, the scientific uh, committee that we have in the background. So I believe many of these names are very familiar to you, especially if you have worked in hypoxia field for longer. So, you know, we have some, some very um, relevant uh, people here to, to, uh, to have put this thing together for us. So, so follow that one, I will keep you posted. Um, and then following, where do I keep you posted? The next slide probably tells you that one. It actually tells the save the date, which is 15th of March for next Hypox EU. But for more information, I would like to see you follow this uh, Twitter character, which is kind of like obviously me, so Dr. Ox. And what I do or she does is posts every day about hypoxia, physoxia stuff. So if you have this need to know what's happening in hypoxia world or with oxygen sensing, uh, maybe mammals or plants or whatever, follow me on Twitter at Dr. Ox. Also at LinkedIn, we have a lot of good material every day. Uh, hashtag supporting science. So I think that was my last slide. No, it wasn't. Of course it wasn't. Dr. Ox also does these very uh, funny and interesting interviews with the leading scientists of, of our, our field. And in this particular picture, you can possibly recognize that's Celeste Simon from University of Pennsylvania. Now I have to say this is a little bit dated slide because I have a new one, a new interviewee. Uh, if you are interested in mitochondria signaling, I just finished an interview with Navdeep Shandell, who's at the University of Chicago or um, Northwestern University. So go and check that link also so you can hear their thoughts about science and life and what, what have you. So but that was my last slide. And now I will hand the floor to our uh, special uh, guest, Claudio, please. Well, here I am. Uh, 
thank you very much, uh, Krista, and thank you very much, uh, Daniel, also for inviting me to give this uh, lecture. I also wish to thank everyone who joined in advance to listen to me. So I will try to share my screen, like in this manner, and I hope that uh, everyone can now see the presentation mode. So uh, I'm very, very glad that I have the opportunity today to uh, speak about the work that uh, me and my group at Linshoping University do since uh, about four years uh, now. And we work a lot in this uh, way in which cells uh, communicate between each other, which is called wind signaling. Um, but before I jump on the hardcore science, let me briefly tell you where we are where Linshoping University is also. Let me maybe choose the uh, laser pointer. So we are a relatively small still university here, which is about, uh, let's say 150 to uh, 200 kilometers south of Stockholm. But the great initiative that was uh, initiated by the Knut Okalis uh, Wallenberg Foundation was to fund smaller universities, smaller in comparison to uh, Stockholm University or, or KI, for example and bring uh, researchers from other parts of the world. So I, I am part of this uh, initiative, which is called the Wallenberg Center for Molecular Medicine. And also, if you have never been here, Linköping is a very beautiful place to visit. So I would welcome any of you to come here, especially in summer. So I made uh, some of those pictures myself. It's a really beautiful place. All right. Uh, now, um, in, in my lab, we uh, look at the most important, I believe, one of the most important questions in biology, as a matter of fact, but a very important question of developmental biology, which is how do you obtain something like this, kind of a complex um, um, organism with several cell types and tissues and organs from something like this? And I know that uh, I don't have to explain this to this audience, but uh, this uh, cell contains all the genomic instruction to make a sophisticated embryo. And the trick is that each cell type will use those instructions in a very different manner to make brain cells as opposed to skin cells or blood cells. Now, as you can see here, we use the mouse as a model system to study this process. Uh, but the mouse is a very, very good model also for studying human uh, organogenesis and embryonic development. Now, the additional um, importance of developmental biology is that when you are a developmental biologist, in a way you become immediately and automatically also a cancer biologist, because several of the processes that occur during embryonic development are precisely what are is activated often in an aberrant manner to produce a cancer. So often a cancer for, for some aspect really looks like a growing tissue during embryogenesis. Now, one of the mysteries of how you obtain from a single cell a complex organism relies in the fact that cells know how to communicate. Now, this might seem a complex thing, but in principle is rather simple. And uh, cells communicate by literally sending messages to each other. So in this drawing, for example, you have a cell which is secreting a molecule, for example, a protein, and a neighboring cell, this could also be a very distant cell, possesses a receptor to recognize this protein. So this is the way in which cells communicate. And then something will happen in the message receiving cell. And what happens in the message receiving cell is what we study in my laboratory. In particular, we study what happens when cells receive a so-called wind uh, message. So wind is the name of a specific class of proteins that navigate in the extracellular uh, space. And they can be recognized by specific receptors on each cell. And when this happens, this triggers a very sophisticated cascade of events. Now, all those events I, are not relevant for the moment, but I, what, what I wish to remind what I wish to stress is that uh, um, one of the consequences of the uh, reception of this signal is uh, the stabilization of a protein, which is called beta-catenin. Beta-catenin is constantly, for some absurd reason, it's constantly produced by, but degraded by this protein complex, which is called the beta-catenin destruction complex. 
but this is inhibited upon wind ligand reception by a cell. And this allows beta-catenin to accumulate, travel to, travel into the nucleus, where beta-catenin can bind to transcription factors and turn genes on, essentially, um, activate the transcription of specific target genes. Now, there are several reasons why we study wind signaling in my lab. One is that, essentially, during embryonic development, nothing can happen if you mutate components of wind signaling. And one classical example is that if you mutate wind signaling, you abrogate the very early phases of embryonic development. As you see here, this is a very early mouse embryo. And this is a, this is a, a, a blockage in the very early steps, which is caused by mutations in this protein that I talked about before, beta-catenin. Again, this is a drawing I showed you already a couple of times, and we made this drawing a couple of years ago and published in a, a review article. But more than 20 years before, there was a very similar drawing by the lab of Marian Beans. And if you look at the two drawings, quite apart from the style in which they are made, the components are essentially the same. We have beta-catenin, we have the same essentially components of the destruction complex, a wind ligand, those receptors which are uh, the same. So basically, in 20 years, we didn't really change our understanding of, of how, when received by cells, a wind signaling is transduced in a transcriptional output. 20 years, and yet we don't know many things still. For example, this is a, a, a developing mouse embryo. And in blue, what you see is um, cells in which there is a very act high activity of wind signaling. This is an in vivo reporter, an in vivo transcriptional reporter of wind signaling. So essentially, wind signaling is active everywhere. But here you have cells that form the face of the mouse. Here you have, for example, the limbs. Those cells need to do intrinsically very different things. So how is it possible that this single cascade, which as we've seen is often represented as a linear series of events, regulates so many different processes? Also, we do not know, for example, how wind signaling, which is known as a stem cell factor, so it sustains the, it sustains the viability and the self-renew of many stem cell populations in our body. And that prototypical example is the intestinal stem cells, which are found at the bottom of the crypt in our intestinal epithelium. And perhaps most importantly um, um, is that a dysregulation of this pathway causes essentially cancer. And the typical cancer that a wind signaling researcher is bound to study is colorectal cancer for a reason that we'll see uh, in a second. Now, um, just to spoil the end of the talk, what we believe, and this is part of the drawings that we made for this review article that we published, we now believe that wind signaling should be represented not really, not really as a linear series of events, but probably as a networks of proteins that interact and interplay. And perhaps this network differs in different uh, cell types. But I will go to show you the evidence why we think that this is the case. Now, what I would like everyone possibly to take home, uh, so the key message is, is that the composition of the protein complex that transforms the wind message into a transcriptional output in target cells is not a universal thing. This is very likely a tissue-specific um, entity. And very importantly, this will have very important consequences on our understanding, both on development, developmental process, and also how to treat cancer, because you want to really know what components are driving a very high wind activity in those cancers that are driven by an, a, a, a dysregulated wind signaling. So, and let me start um, with our data concerning uh, the cancer part. Now, as I mentioned before, colorectal cancer is essentially a wind signaling disease. This is the classical Vogelstein progression of mutagenesis that leads from neoplastic formation to very nasty and metastatic carcinomas. And it has been recognized since more than 20 years now that one of the, perhaps the first mutation uh, 
uh, that causes the onset of colorectal cancer is a mutation in a, call, in a gene called APC, which stands for adomatose, adenomatose polyposis coli. And this protein is a protein found in the beta-catenin destruction complex. So if you lose the function of this APC protein, beta-catenin cannot be degraded and it accumulates constitutively. So it can activate the pathway in a constitutive manner. And in some, many cells, this pathway tells the cells, you are a stem cell, you should proliferate. And this, of course, is something that will lead to a negative uh, outcome. And more than 80% of the whole human colorectal tumors display loss of function mutations in APC. Again, a non-functional beta-catenin destruction complex. So many people tried, of course, to inhibit wind signaling, maybe with chemicals or like small compounds that can enter the cell and, for example, inhibit specific protein-protein interactions. For example, you want to inhibit a protein interaction that beta-catenin has with the nuclear transducers of the pathway. For example, this TCF-LEF, those are transcription factors which are required for beta-catenin to bind the DNA. Otherwise, beta-catenin alone cannot bind the DNA. So a very good idea might be that we design a drug to inhibit the interaction between beta-catenin and TCF. People try to do that, but what happens is that this interaction, as you see in the drawing on the left, is mediated by sort of a, a broad surface on the beta-catenin protein. And this surface is also shared by, for example, APC. So a negative regulator of the pathway. So most often the outcome was that when you try to inhibit this interaction, you're also inhibiting this interaction. And this led to sort of a promiscuous outcome that was not desirable. But 20 years ago, there was a very, very important discovery in the field, which was the discovery of these two proteins here, which are called BCL9 and Pigopus. Now they would appear to be immediately super important. Now, this drawing already represents how they work. And basically, they are thought to bind the beta-catenin. As we said, beta-catenin cannot bind the DNA. It needs to bind TCF transcription factor to, rec to recognize where on the DNA it should bind, so to recognize its target genes. And then beta-catenin cannot also activate the transcription. It needs cofactors. And this is what these two proteins do, PCL9 and Pigopus. They are the cofactors that activate the transcri transcription, for example, by recruiting the RNA polymerase to, to target genes. Now, if you mutate those genes in Drosophila melanogaster, where they have been discovered, you obtain a phenotype like this. Quite apart from the details, this is a, 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 an early uh, um, larva of a, of a fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. This phenotype is what you expect when you completely lose wind signaling. So if you mutate BCN9 or Pigopus in flies, you completely abrogate wind signaling. And also here on the right, there is a very beautiful experiment which was done in the Connie Basler lab at the University of Zurich, in which what they have done is to take this NHT domain, this is quite apart from the sophisticated name, this is the domain that was supposed to activate the transcription of target genes. So they fused this domain together with this HD2 domain, homology domain 2, so to create a small chimeric protein that can allow the NHT domain to bind beta-catenin, thanks to this. It's a small chimeric protein that, for example, you can see here. And by inserting the transgene encoding for this small chimeric protein, those scientists could rescue the um, lethality of double PIGO and BCL9 mutant flies. And this really indicated that these two components have the sole function of bringing this domain to beta-catenin in order to activate wind target genes. So they appear to be fundamental and dedicated components. And also because specific interaction domains were discovered, they appear to be the best targets, for example, for colorectal cancer therapy. So I was in high school, basically, when this was discovered. So uh, um, we had to wait for a few years. But then um, we decided to look uh, into this problem and try to target 
those two proteins, BCL9 and Pigopus, to see whether they could be targets for colorectal cancer. Of course, we used uh, mouse models, and in the mouse, you can induce colorectal cancers that are very, very similar to those that we see in humans. You can do this in different manners, for example, by chemicals or by genetics. You can introduce those genes, for example, this a loss of function mutation in APC, that are causative of colorectal cancer in humans. And this is what we did. And I just want to share with you a few results. Now, the rationale that we had, it's very simple, actually. So we designed and generated mutations in the mouse so that to abrogate, so that we could abrogate those specific interaction domains. For example, we removed this domain so that the final configuration of the transcriptional complex should be something like this, where Pigopus cannot bind anymore. Alternatively, we remove the H2, HD2 domain so that these two proteins could bind each other, but they cannot bind beta-catenin. So they cannot participate to the beta-catenin transcriptional complex. So let's see some data. Now, what I'm showing you is a section of a tumor in the mouse. So this is a colorectal tumor in the mouse, which we could collect and induce how we uh, mentioned before. And we could cut to see how the tumor looks like. Now, this is a staining of a section of a tumor. The tumor is an epithelial tumor, as you can see here. But the tumor expresses these green spikes of protein. The protein, this protein that is stained in green is called vimentin. Now, this was a little bit of a problem because vimentin is a mesenchymal marker. It should not be expressed in epithelial cells. But of course, I guess that all of you already know the answer. Those tumors are simply, they are epithelial, but they are undergoing what is it known as epithelial to mesenchymal translation, transition, EMT in short, in which epithelial cells become mobile and migratory. And this is one of the mechanisms that is thought to activate metastatic formation starting from um, epithelial tumors. Now, our experiment allowed us to have tumors that look like this. And the genetic configuration in which we had the conditional alleles of BCL9 um, that could be recombined, genetically removed, cut, by um, uh, the presence of an enzyme, which we can induce by injecting a, injecting a drug into the mouse, a drug called tamoxifen. So we have a mouse that basically in, that having, this, if, having these tumors, and anytime we want, we can inject tamoxifen. This will lead to removal of BCL9 from those tumors. And check out what happens. So what happens really was striking and surprised us because these tumors looked like this. But once you remove BCL9, they lose all the metata metastatic traits. And the epithelium loses the expression of the mesenchymal markers, which are only found, as you see here, in the stroma. This is a stroma that stays below uh, the epithelium in the tumor. Of course, this very powerful phenotype in shift is suggestive of um, something very good so that you can revert a bad phenotype of a tumor into a better one by targeting BCL9. Of course, this is a genetic proof of principle. But then we looked at the, uh, um, the available um, data sets in human colorectal cancers. Actually, we found that there are a lot. For example, at the time, we, lot, we found a lot of microarrays already um, RNA sequencing of human colorectal cancers. And if you take those data sets and you apply what we call a BCL9 signature. So those genes that go up and go down in the mouse when you knock out BCL9, the human data set splits in two curves. And basically, the humans whose tumors look, look like more the BCL9 knockout, so without the activity of BCL9, they performed much better, both in terms of disease-free survival and overall survival. And this very powerfully suggests that BCL9 can be targeted for colorectal cancer therapy. And this is very, very powerful. And we are very encouraged by the idea that from, as a consequence of our work and or, work from other labs working on this topic, now there are groups of people looking for chemicals that precisely will and specifically will inhibit the interaction between BCL9 and beta-catenin by 
interfering with this HD2 domain that we have deleted in the mouse. Of course, as I said in the beginning, there are two components that we wanted to test. This BCL9, this sort of bridge protein that tethers the ultimate transcriptional activator, PIGO, this, this protein that you see here. So we were doing experiment to see whether this is even a better target. Now, I want to show you that a little bit of a complication, sophistication in the genetics. It turns out that differently from Drosophila, the mouse and also humans, as a matter of fact, all vertebrates that I checked personally, have two copies of the BCL9 genes. They are paralog genes on different chromosomes. And the same is true for Pigopus. And those two copies are called BCL9 and BCL9-like, in the case of BCL9, and Pigo1 and Pigo2. Now, they are highly redundant. We know this from other evidence, but and for the moment, we will consider them as a, as a single unit. So I will talk about BCL9, and with this, I will mean that I will, we have been considering both of the paralogs in most of our experiments. So in our experiment, where we are looking at the tumor function, we could very efficiently remove BCL9 and BCN like from the mouse genome. And the same is true for Pigopus. So this is to make sure that the results that we have um, downstream are very reliable and are the consequence of the genetic removal of BCL9. We have already seen what happens when we remove BCL9. And let me a little bit recap with some gene expression profiling. So we also looked at several target genes and how they behave when we remove BCL9, again, the bridge protein. And if you look at wing target genes or genes that have to, that regulate stemness of the intestinal epithelial stem cells or ENT genes, they are strongly downregulated when BCL9 is removed. But check what happens when we remove Pigopus. Let me simplify with essentially almost anything. We just have a few genes that, that are downregulated, but most of the genes are almost unperturbed. And I've shown you that we can very efficiently remove Pigopus genetically. But this shows a very, a very profound discrepancy. If uh, the model that is depicted here is correct, you should expect at least a very similar phenotype upon removal of Pigopus or BCL9. But that is not the case. And this is also confirmed by the phenotype that I showed before. Again, this is a control tumor, and this is a Pigo knockout tumor. And the Pigo knockout tumor doesn't lose the metastatic traits. So it looks like that removing Pigopus does not have strong consequences. There might be subtle ones, but broad those, by looking with those methods, we couldn't detect any strong differences. Now, in the beginning, I've shown you that we generated a lot of tools with the mutation of the HD2 domain that binds beta-catenin, but also the domain that binds Pigopus. Now, this experiment was done when I was a postdoc at the University of Zurich, and we tried to see what happens in the mouse if you remove this red domain. This is the Pigo binding domain. Now, probably most of you is wondering, I mean, this is a little bit of a stupid experiment. Claudio, you just showed us that if you remove Pigopus, nothing happens. And I have to agree with you. So we started this experiment before we knew the result of the Pigopus knockout. And then we thought that we just finished it, but check what happened. So basically, when you remove this domain, we still observe the very strong reversal in, on, on, of the phenotype, of the metastatic phenotype, which is very different from the Pigopus removal. And again, also, this is confirmed on the gene expression profile. So if you don't look at all the details, please, but maybe you follow my uh, uh, laser um, pointer. This is the expression as seen by quantitative PCR of four different wind target genes expressed in the tumor. And this is the expression in the control tumor, and this is the expression in the PIGO knockout tumor. And you see the expression of all the four genes does not change much in the PIGO knockout tumor. But when we remove the red domain, so the deletion of this HD1 domain, boom! Check this out. All of those are very strongly affected. And consider that this is a logarithmic scale. So to briefly recap, what I'm telling you is that when we remove this domain, we have a very strong positive reversion in phenotype. So we can target the HD2 domain to try to uh, maybe ameliorate the phenotype of a colorectal cancer. The same is true if we target the red domain that, as far as we know, binds Picopus. 
but this doesn't happen if we target Picopus. And unless anyone has another idea, which I would be very welcome to listen, we thought that this is a very strong indication that in colorectal cancer, there is a new partner bound by the red domain, which is very likely not Picopus. And then we started to look for this partner and we arranged sophisticated protein-protein uh, interaction assays to pull down together with BCL9 the, the proteins that might be relevant. And we obtained a group, quite a large group of potential BCL9 interactors. But of these 220 candidates, I almost didn't recall a second because we immediately focused on a protein, which is called TBX3. Now, TBX3 was found in this group. And TBX3, of course, every developmental biologist knows what TBX3 is, is a very important transcription factor that, wor that um, is, 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 it works in a tissue-specific manner, in particular in tissues such as uh, the, the, the four limbs uh, formation. As a matter of fact, if you mutate TBX3 in the mouse, you have a very uh, prominent uh, loss, for example, of digit specification or elongation of the, of, the fur limb, of the fur limb in the mouse, the equivalent of our arms. And why did we focus on TBX3 only? Well, because we already knew that when we mutate this red domain in the mouse, and instead of looking at the tumor, we look at embryogenesis, at developmental processes, we have a very strong phenotype in the limb. So those limbs, as you see here, which are sort of already patterned in the control, lose their digits in the mutant. And also during the development, we already knew that this is a pigopus independent phenotype. So if you mutate pigopus, the forelimb or the arms of the mouse are like those in the control. So we already knew about a BCL9 that function during development that is pigo independent. And this essentially is like TBX3 phenotype. So one of the first experiments that we did was the sort of the sort of the most complex one was to look at if BCL9 and TBX3 cooperate on a genome-wide level by binding and regulating the same uh, target genes. And we used a technology, which is something that we use very frequently in my lab now, which is called chromatin immunoprecipitation followed by sequencing, which precisely allows to detect where a protein or a transcription factor binds genome-wide. Now we did the experiment for um, um, BCL9 and TBX3. To do this experiment, we had to, this was a little bit of a problem ethically also, because we had to uh, sacrifice more than 200 embryos. And I'll come to that uh, in the uh, later part of my talk. Now, what to look at? Once you have done this experiment, we know that, for example, some regions of the genome should be bound by BCL9. For example, this gene here, this is a schematic representation of the genomic locus of axin 2, the favorite win target gene. And we should expect that BCL9 binds here in the promoter, where wind responsive elements have been found, at the beginning of the intron 1, at the end of intron 1. Well, we do the experiment and we see peaks. So where we see peaks is the enrichment of sequencing reads and in which interpret as the protein binds here. So BCL9 binds in the promoter at the beginning of intron 1 and then the end of intron 1. So the experiment worked well. So far, so good. We can detect the wind uh, transcriptional complex. But check out with TBX3. So TBX3 precisely binds exactly where BCL9 is. Now, this is one wind target gene. You can ask me any target gene, and I can show this in the genome browser, but I have prepared one slide with a few of those. So any of the major known target genes that we could look at displays both occupancy of BCL9 and TBX3 precisely in the same position. And this is, I have to say, valid on a genome-wide scale. Now, we came up with the, with the model, and I'm going to summarize this here. Um, and uh, uh, what we could identify is that TBX3, as a matter of fact, influences the expression of wind target genes. And this role is dependent on the presence of beta catenin and TCFLF. We could also show that if you mutate BCL9, TBX3 floats away. It cannot physically associate to those genomic regions any longer. And also very important, we could show that TBX3 can enhance when overexpressed the migratory potential of human colorectal cancer cells. 
So I, I will skip on those, but if you are interested in looking at the details, now this is uh, uh, published uh, in the journal in life, and every one of you is uh, very welcome to look at the details of how we discover that. Importantly, this left us with a kind of an interesting follow-up project on which we are working on in collaboration with the Andreas Moore, who is assistant professor at ETH in Zurich, Switzerland. And what we identified is that this is a kind of an, a, a, a single molecule fish, like we detect individual transcripts in the normal colonic epithelium. And what you see here is the expression of LGR5, which marks intestinal stem cells, essentially. And in, 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 in a in a context of an invasive tumor, those cells, LGR5 positive cells, start displaying those red dots, which is TBX3. So basically what we are now hypothesizing is that when a tumor, a colorectal tumor form, um, forms, as a consequence of a hyperactivated wind signaling, TBX3 gets upregulated. And then what TBX3 does is still not known, and we are investigating that, but we might even think that TBX3, in this case, starts to activate developmental genes that are important for limb development, something very, very weird. Now we start to have the first evidence, for example, by analyzing single cell transcriptomics data, where we see expression of those genes, which are transcription factors uh, involved in limb development in the TBX3 expressing cells in human tumors. But let me show one of my favorite uh, things, which is uh, um, what we discovered also that happens during development. Of course, when we generated those mice, we were also very curious in understanding what is the role of those proteins, BCN and picopus, during developmental processes. And just to remind, what we did, of course, was to uh, remove the, sorry, now the X is on the wrong domain, to remove the HD1 domain or to remove the HD2 domain. This is just a refreshing, slide, it's going to be very important to follow the rest of the um, data sets. And one of the first observations that we did during the embryology of those mutants was that when we mutate this red domain, the pigopus binding domain, as you can see here, the embryo, this is an embryo at 13 days of development. We are a little bit after mid-gestation, where essentially organogenesis have already occurred. And didn't I tell you before that if you mutate wind signaling, you block at the very early stages of embryonic development? That's true if you mutate beta catenin but if you mutate this red domain, apparently this is not what, hap what happens. And most of the organs can develop properly. If you pay a little bit of attention, however, there is something weird in this embryo. It might be a little bit smaller, but also there is a weird thing in the eye. And what we found is that those embryos do not form a eye lens, as you can see in those sections. This is a presumptive lens in a control mouse, which is completely missing in the mutant. And you can see it also from sort of uh, far away. Um, now, the very interesting thing is that you can detect this process since a few days before. Now, in a control mouse, there is the surface head ectoderm, which thickens and then invaginates at day, 10 days of development to form what is called a lens pit and then lens vesicle. And this process is abrogated at, very, at the very onset of the lens pit formation, as you see here. There is no invagination of this layer. Now, as I mentioned before, we also generated the mice in which we deleted this other domain, the H2 domain, which also we, have, where we were doing the experiment to see what are the consequences. And what we, we observed here was also striking. So if you remove the blue domain, which would allow those two proteins, BCN and Pigopus, to bind together, but not to associate with the beta catenin transcriptional complex, then the lens is forming. And this clearly showed that the lens formation requires these two proteins, PCN and Picopus, to bind, but they don't care to bind the beta catenin transcription complex. They are doing something else in this tissue. Now, this is one example, which we published a few years ago in, the, in genes and development, but we also discovered other instances during development in which BCN and Picopus act independently of beta catenin, which sort of moved us to wonder if those two proteins are relevant at all in the wind signaling beta-catenin function during development. 
So it took us a few years to understand that we could breed those two mutations, like the mutation, let me show, in the blue domain or the mutation in the red domain. If we made a mouse with this genetic configuration with a mouse with this genetic configuration, we should obtain some mice, as a matter of fact, one in 16, if we take into account both PCL9 and its paralog, BCL9-like, in which one allele with, will have a mutation in the red domain. So this allele will produce a protein that can bind beta-catenin, but not pigopus. The other allele will produce a protein that can bind pigopus, but not beta-catenin. So the two functions of binding the two favorite partners are conserved. What is missing in this mouse is that there will not be any single molecule of BCL9 that can bind pigopus and beta-catenin simultaneously. So this was a way for us to test the simultaneous requirement of these three guys. So the tripartite complex, is this ever at work? Well, it turns out that it, it, it is. Um, and I will go very quickly um, I, I will sk uh, skip all the details, but what we found is that essentially when we mutate those two domains, as I've shown you before, we obtain a four limb defect and also a very strong defect in the heart, which very likely causes the lethality of those mice at this stage. But again, as you see in blue, which is again a, an in vivo transcription reporter of wind signaling, there is a lot of wind signaling and organogenesis going on in those mutants. And this is a question that still needs to be answered. What regulates wind signaling if BCL9 and Pigopos are not doing that in all those tissues? And in our lab, we are trying to respond to these questions. So I've shown you several instances in which, for example, in a colorectal cancer, you need BCL9 to drive metastasis formation, and very likely you also need TBX3 to be recruited to the beta-catenin um, transcriptional complex. Other tissues don't care of the presence of those two proteins, and still we need to figure out who are the binding partners of beta-catenin. And for some other tissues, this tripartite complex might be at work. But I wish to remind you that what we are showing here is called canonical wind signaling, canonical or beta-catenin signaling. But I'm, I'm showing you three distinct molecular mechanisms, and this is what needs to be clarification in the field. But we can say, sort of make a deal and say, we call canonical what still includes beta-catenin. So we keep beta-catenin here, and we don't move it, and we call it canonical. We have seen that what is above beta-catenin could change, can what is be like below change? Like if we remove those transcription factors, can still beta-catenin have a function? Now we checked that in collaboration with uh, Connie Basler at the University of Zurich and Nikolaus Dumpas, a very brilliant postdoc. And what we did is essentially generated a, a, a quadruple knockout line. We did this in HEC 293 which is a very good model for studying wind signaling. So a quadruple knockout where all the four TCF left uh, genes encoding those transcription factors were removed. And let me show what happens. Now, those are again chromatin immunoprecipitation experiments showing of beta-catenin. So we can see where beta-catenin binds in the genome. And we can see that uh, those are triplicate experiments in wild type cells. Again, our favorite locus, axin 2 we can detect beta-catenin binding where it's supposed to bind. If we remove TCF-LEF, as it is shown here, then the uh, beta-catenin does not bind anymore. So far, so good, and everything is happening as expected. So beta-catenin cannot bind those regions if you remove the transcription factors onto which beta-catenin goes. But we found other genomic loci which behave in a very different manner. So even if you remove TCF left, then beta-catenin still associates with the chromatin. This is, shows physical association. Of course, what is the transcription factor that mediates this in the absence of TCF left? Well, we didn't know. We probably still don't know um, completely, but we found one very good candidate, which is FOXO4. And we found it by find, we found it by looking at motif recognition in those peaks where beta-catenin still binds. And um, we could identify that FOXO4 physically um, associate as a, associates as a protein to beta-catenin. And then some of those genes, if you remove FOXO4, are down-regulated. And those are both beta-catenin and 
FOXO4-dependent genes. Um, we coined a term to call this beta-catenin behavior, which we call GHOST, because it looks like that there are a lot of targets which are hidden by the predominant activity of beta-catenin, which is to bind TCF-LEF transcription factors and regulate other target genes. Now, one problem of this experiment is that was done, as I mentioned before, in HEC. HEC is a cell line which grows since uh, more than 50 years in our petri dishes. One could argue that it's not even human any longer. So we needed to add some understanding about is this physiologically relevant? So we essentially did the same experiment in a better model. This model, the model that we chose is mouse embryonic stem cells. So mouse embryonic stem cells basically are cells that are pluripotent. They can make an entire mouse, and they do if you inject them into a blastocyst, and they into a blastocyst, and they are obtained from a late blastocyst of the mouse. The advantage of those cells is that they are not only physiologically relevant, but you can culture them essentially forever. Um, in, in, in your petri dishes. You just need to add a sophisticated mixture of compounds, which we are going to call 2IL. This stands for two inhibitors and LIF, so 2IL. So you need to apply this medium, otherwise the cells die. They stop renewing and they die. If you remove 2IL, bye-bye embryonic stem cells. Just let me point out one of the things. One of the two inhibitors is KIR. KIR is very important for us because KIR is an agonist of wind signaling. So what KIR does is inhibiting the one of the components, GSK3, of the destruction complex. So when you add KIR, you activate wind signaling very downstream. So you allow stabilization of beta-catenin. Beta-catenin can go into the nucleus and activate wind target genes. This was one of the mechanisms that was thought to act in embryonic stem cells. So to maintain self-renewal, you need to add KIR also to activate beta-catenin activity. This was one of the possible mechanisms. Let me show you what happens. Now, again, we generate the quadruple TCF-LEF knockout and could show that those proteins are gone. In parallel, we, we created a clone which doesn't have beta-catenin, but still has the TCF-LEF transcription factors. And then we also generated a pentanocout clone, so five mutants, so beta catenin mutated on top of all the four transcription factors, TCF left. Of course, none of those cell lines can activate wind target genes. At different levels, they all have impaired the machinery to activate wind targets. But check what happens. So wild type cells, as I mentioned before, when you remove the 2IL medium, they die. You can wait after a few passages, but you see here they are already very unhappy. And after a while, they just die. And in our quadruple knockout, where TCF left transcription factors are gone, those cells become essentially niche independent. They become independent from 2IL, which was very weird also if you consider the function of KIR as an agonist of wind signaling. And this become even weirder if you consider that when you knock out beta-catenin, then those cells don't become niche independent. And this is already suggestive that very likely what something in this medium very likely here is doing is inhibiting the function of TCF-LEF, but not of beta-catenin. It's not activating the function of beta-catenin. And now, we wanted to understand a little bit the mechanism. I will skip over the details, but um, let me just show a few, um, a few um, details. So this is an experiment in which you look at what are the possible TCF left targets that are independent of beta catenin. We, we used RNA sequencing on those mutated cells. And we identified three genes. There are many interesting genes, but also here we had some, some sort of an intuition because we, we noticed that those three genes lie very close to each other in the same genomic locus. And they are downregulated if you remove tcf left in a very similar manner. So we sort of focused on those three genes. And at least two of them, IRE and DNMT, um, 3L have been previously implicated in embryonic stem cell, embryonic stem cells renewal. And what we could show essentially is that, again, by chromatin immunoprecipitation, one of our favorite techniques, that those 
this locus is targeted by TCF left transcription factors. This is just a control to show that other regions that are known to be targeted are also targeted in our experiment. While when we look at beta catenin, beta catenin targets the known wind target genes, but it doesn't target this region. Again, this confirms our genetic observation that this is a TCF function that doesn't depend on beta catenin. So what we could identify is that this region is actually a topologically associated domains with increased interaction uh, within this locus. And it also, this region acts as an enhancer that strongly responds to TCF left transcription factors. Now, to make a longer story short, what we could show is that TCF left regulate the looping of this locus in order to regulate those three genes to allow the exit from embryonic stem cells. Um, pluri um, 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 pluripotency. And this was uh, done by a joint effort of uh, Nicolas Dumpas um, in the Connie Basler lab and Simon Soderholm, who is a PhD student in my lab at Linköping University. Now, um, this is probably understand, this is to maybe clarify why I chose the title of reconstructing wind signal, reconstructing in the sense that we want to rebuild the new models that represent better the reality and is more compatible with the observations. So what we could conclude is that the composition of the wind transcriptional complex is a very likely a tissue specific entity. So I believe that we can discard this as a universal generalizable model describing every the execution of this pathway in every tissue. We could find examples, uh, exceptions of this model in several um, tissues that we look at that. We found that, for example, also beta catenin can activate with can activate other genes by interplaying with other transcription factors in addition with TCF left. We even found that TCF left has beta catenin independent function in embryonic stem cells self renewal. And we also have seen that those informations are very important to understand what should we target in colorectal cancer. We should discover what are actually the components, for example, the binding partners of beta catenin or the proteins that associate to the wind, to the relevant wind target genes in this specific uh, context. Now, if you have five minutes of patience, I want to show one, only one of the approaches that we are now using in my lab to understand these questions. Uh, this question. Now, one of the hypotheses that we made recently was that beta catenin might be sort of the interface, like the fulcrum of a combinatorial usage of transcription factors binding the DNA and transcriptional regulator, regulators who recruit, which can recruit the DNA RNA polymerase. This means that we could detect in principle those proteins by the experiment I showed you uh, many times, chromatin immunoprecipitation. Now, for example, what we sort of imagine is that we can use chromatin immunoprecipitation to detect those proteins when the wind pathway is off, and when we activate the wind pathway, it's something that we can do in vivo in the mouse by looking at wind um, cells that have active wind signaling, but also in vitro using our HEC model, we could expect and measure a potential rearrangement of proteins. So we can think that we will be able to detect beta catenin binding its favorite target genes and other proteins coming, coming into the scene. Can we actually do this with ChIP-seq? As I show you, this will be very difficult because what we want to extend this is this across different logic. Of course, we want to look at genome wide. We want to look at different cell types precisely because our finding is that every tissue where you look at leads to a different outcome. And then we want to look at time because different target genes might have a different time for their activation. Now, CHIP is not really suitable for this sort of larger scale. Um, endeavor because chip for example requires a huge number of cells and often you don't have those cells if you get the tumor biopsies from the clinics or if you want to study a specific cell type during mouse development there is of course an alternative and i bet that everyone is uh, already or already knows this technology is called cataran a beautiful acronym that stands for cut and cut under targets and release using nucleases and it works a little bit differently from a uh, chip. Um, and it's sort of magic how it works. I couldn't believe that it would the first time we did the experiment. But basically, what you can do is immobilize your cells and permeabilize them so that an antibody recognizes your favorite transcription factor, recognize 
this protein. And then you add to this solution a fusion protein, which is called PA-MNAs. Now, PA is protein A. This recognizes with very high affinity the constant chains of the antibodies. And MNAs is an endonuclease. So when you give calcium, this will cut. So when this complex is formed, you give calcium, and then the micrococcal nuclease will cut left and right of your transcription factor. You can collect the digested fragments for DNA sequencing and identify by uh, next generation sequencing all the regions where your transcription factor is binding. Of course, we started one of our, our favorite targets, TBX3. And as you can see, Cateran worked beautifully, so we can detect essentially the same pattern of peaks as we detected in ChIP-seq. But you might wonder, you have done the experiment already, why bothering of looking at other technology? Well, the reason is this. As I mentioned before, to do a ChIP-seq, we needed to, to use 500 four limbs. This meant sacrificing 250 embryos. Now, quite apart from the um, the effort that researchers have to make this, there is also a very important concern co about the et ethics of using so many mice for an, an experiment which ultimately could fail. And we could just do replicate this data set with three limbs. This means one and a half mouse embryos, which is uh, so far um, really nice. We're interested in wind signaling. Of course, not everything is um, shining that we encountered some problems. For example, we couldn't do cataran with beta catenin. So this is a chip seek for beta catenin. It took me forever to do this experiment in a successful manner. But now we have been having problem with cataran when targeting this protein. I wish to remind you that beta catenin doesn't bind directly the DNA. And this might, for example, not allow the reach of the micrococcal nucleus to, to cut the DNA. Or maybe in such a huge protein complex, the DNA fragments are not released. So we thought about many reasons why this would not work. And we hypothesized that sort of there are three difficulty levels, like in video games, to do cut and run. Because we noticed that it's relatively easy to detect histone modifications, which are very abundant and exposed from the DNA, and there are very good antibodies for those. It's relatively difficult to look at DNA binding proteins like transcription factors, but on this we have been very successful. And it's very difficult to do cofactors like beta-catenin. Now, I will have to skip uh, for all the details, but we are almost ready to go out with the um, preprint for a, with a method paper describing all the details of our new Cateran protocol, which is called LoveU protocol. And I promise LoveU is a real acronym, which stands for low volumes and a secret reagent we use for DNA purification. And this, as you see, allowed us to detect also beta-catenin by using Cateran with a low cell uh, input. And this work was done uh, by many in the lab, but prominently by Gianluca Zambanini, very bright student. And Gianluca could show that this his new protocol works across the levels of the difficulty for Cateran uh, in cell lines, but of course also in mouse tissues. And still, we are having some issues with beta catenin here, but it's probably, but here probably the uh, difficulty lies in the fact that it's difficult to identify the few cells where beta catenin is active in the nucleus. Now, essentially, in the lab, we have a sort of a small Caterran team, uh, which was led by Matthias originally. Matthias now uh, left for uh, the Elitanaka lab at IMP. Uh, very prestigious institute and lab in Vienna. And then with the other four players, Gianluca, Anna, Pierfrancesco, and the mouse, we are doing several projects. We are collaborating with the group in Milano to detect SOX2 binding pattern in neural uh, development. We are working with uh, uh, Hani and Darcy Wegner in Lund um, to detect YAP and TADS activity. And for example, with Lucas Sommers, we have been recently um, co-author a nature communication paper by looking at the, the co the interplay between SAL4 and HDAC2. But very dear to me, we have a very huge project looking at a number of transcription factors uh, in select um, developmental contexts, where we sort of want to create an atlas of DNA binding. Uh, uh, proteins. And this collaboration is, it, th these proteins also rendered possible by collaboration with the company Antibodies Online and Stefan Pellens, who is one of um, its representatives. Now, I 
I'm done. I probably have taken more than the time that I was allowed. Let me just briefly acknowledge the people that was involved. Like all this work that they showed was done in collaboration with uh, the University of Zurich in the lab of Connie Basler or ETH in the lab of uh, Andreas Moore. And we have done the embryonic stem cell work also with Bradley Doble uh, from a University of Manitoba in Canada. But most of all, I would like to acknowledge and thank the people working in my lab because they are making my life filled with satisfactions. And also, of course, the sponsor that allow us to uh, recruit personnel and, the, and buy reagents. I am done with my presentation. I will stop sharing the screen and I will leave again the word to Daniel. I am very, very grateful for your attention and I look forward to the Q&A. So, yes, you did uh, move uh, past the time limit a little bit, but we didn't, I didn't have the heart to stop you when you're so enthusiastic and the lecture is so darn interesting. Uh, thank you very thank much, you. Claudio, for joining us for this uh, webinar series. We're very happy to have you here. Um, uh, before we move on to the Q&A, I would just like to present our next event in the series. And then you'll get to ask your questions to Claudio. So let's see. And there we go. So March the 24th, we will be joined by uh, Gerald or Jerry McGinnery at the Karolinska Institute, who will present his work on uh, developing alpaca nanobodies for the fight against COVID. So they essentially put all their studies on hold when the pandemic started and put all their effort into this. And he's gonna tell about his work doing this, which we look forward to very much. So save the date, March the 24th, if you're interested in this. Um, if you're interested in our webinars overall, please follow us on Twitter at Swedish Cell Bio. And of course, if uh, anyone a Swedish researcher in the audience, because that's the theme we have, is interested in holding a webinar with us in the future, like the one we've had with Claudio today, please contact me at Daniel at Milmatech or find us on Twitter, which you will see there as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going now to stop the recording and we're gonna change the settings in this software a little bit so we can bring in more people to use their webcams and microphones.